Hello, everyone, and welcome. I hope you can hear me and see me. Um, if you'd like to type into the chat that you can say, see me and hear me and see Daria, uh, then just uh, do so, say hi, just to let us know you're here, and then we can get started with tonight's episode. So um, there's a bit of a delay. There are, at the moment, viewers, I can see that. Um, <laughs> there's actually people out there, I can see it on the screen. I don't know who they are yet because they haven't said hi. Um, I haven't found out exactly how long the delay is, if it's two minutes or four minutes, I've heard four. Oh, there's Carol, yay, Helen, Pamela, yay. Okay, we're good to go. So welcome to tonight's episode of Aging the Mediterranean Way. I am, of course, Laureen Sorrow. I'm a registered holistic nutritionist, and I am also a gut health specialist. So we're going to be talking a little bit about the Mediterranean diet and the gut connection. And with me tonight is Daria Howell, and she's way over on the West Coast in Portland, Oregon, coming to us live tonight. Um, <laughs> and I don't think she's had her dinner yet either. No, no, we're fixing it right now. <laughs> okay, she's making dinner and then she to show you and then she's going to eat it. All right. So, um, Daria, uh, why don't you tell them about yourself and your modalities and how you ended up having a focus on the Mediterranean diet and working with people people of a certain age. <laughs> Well, I happen to be of a certain age, and I happen to be of Mediterranean descent, so there's those two right off the bat. Right. But I am a, a certified functional nutrition and lifestyle practitioner, so functional being looking at the whole picture and kind of using the, um, the tools that functional medicine uses, so looking at the whole body systems and all of that to get to the root of whatever's going on with folks. And it works really well. So I'm, uh, I'm proud to be in that group of colleagues that know how to do that work and, and you included. You. Um, I've learned a lot from you, so I kudos. Um, focus on aging, I don't know. I guess it goes back to when I was a kid. My parents were not that healthy. They, you know, they had me, my mom had me when she was 18 or 19, I guess. and. My whole childhood, she was in and out of the hospital. My dad, although he, he had a great physique and he looked fit and healthy, he um, was also not that well and had his first heart attack when he was 39. So I was truly concerned and I wanted to find out how to stay healthy. So I, you know, I was kind of into looking at nutrition my whole life, raised my kids on Adele Davis and <laughs> probably other people that most of these folks haven't heard of, but um, yeah, just kind of a nerd about it. And then even though I, you know, I had that interest like all along, I ended up with terrible depression, really kind of a, a nervous breakdown actually um, in my thirties. And it was a holistic doctor that sort of pulled me out of it to, for a time had to go off all sugar, you know, specific supplements and pay more attention to my stress levels and things like that, that turned it around. So I really know that it makes a difference in how people age and how healthy you are in general. Well, I think that's a very valid point because I think people don't realize that, you know, having the knowledge doesn't always translate into uh, the best health outcome depending on your stress levels and what's going on in your life. Um, the world that we live in doesn't make it easy for us to have the best quality foods and the most nutrient rich foods. It, it just doesn't. And it doesn't take much to throw people off of their game, even with their best intentions. And yeah. so this is why we kind of want to have this discussion uh, you know, this is what we've been doing the episodes for in total, but uh, in specific to this one, because let's face it, um, there's a lot of interest in aging, especially as you age. I, I find it more interesting the older I get. <laughs> I want to know more about aging. <laughs> I wonder why that is. Um, so that that's a very good, valid um, sort of description of what a lot of people go through. 
And so we're talking about the Mediterranean diet. And before I sort of go into the research that I found that is kind of interesting, Daria, do you want to tell them specifically, if you're going to sum up in a nutshell, what the Mediterranean diet includes? Well, it's the traditional diet of people who live in the Mediterranean basin, around the Mediterranean. A um, couple of the people may have heard of the blue zones. So the places where people are especially long-lived and healthy into, you know, into the hundreds even, um, two of those zones are actually in the Mediterranean. And it's that traditional diet which is focused, you know, largely on plant foods. They rule, there's an emphasis on vegetables and fruits and whole grains, um, minimal amounts of animal proteins, but healthy grass-fed, you know, wild-caught, that sort of thing. More, more seafood, actually, than um, other types of proteins. And lots of beans. And then the best part, red wine. <laughs> But all, but all that variety, so, so much variety, along with herbs and spices, because they really, you know, value tasty dishes, um, that all of those things have their own nutrients. Every, every different type of food has its own nutrients, and it's all important for our general health. And I think this is a, a point that needs to be made over and over again. Um, is that you need this variety and you need the nutrients that are in the different varieties. And the more you have, and this is, this is what the research that I came across is speaking to. So why don't I just do that part now because then it doesn't sound like I'm postponing the good stuff now. <laughs> and then we can get to the recipes, which I'm sure people want to see. So I'm just going to um, go into screen share. All right, and hopefully you can all see that. And I can operate this mouse. There we go. Okay, so aging currently, with the current research, has been linked to dysbiosis, not having enough good bacteria and having more bad bacteria than is ideal for you to have. What ratio that is varies. And one of the things they found with aging is the older you get and the more uh, conditions that you develop, the more dysbiosis you have. So as dysbiosis goes up, so does infirmity. So that's interesting to me. But then a couple of years ago, I came across a study that was done uh, with a joint effort between the Canadians and the Chinese, where they looked at a thousand people in China from the ages of three to a hundred. And they examined their poop to see what kind of diversity of strains did they have? What's how much was you know good? How much variety there was? You know how many different strains? All that kind of thing as as best can be determined because we still don't have all the the numbers yet. And what they found was that when they looked at the bacterial diversity of those who were in their 90s but still amazingly healthy, so they didn't have any high blood pressure or high triglycerides or they weren't overweight, they didn't have arthritis. You know, they didn't have any brain cognitive function problems. They found that their poop had the same kind of quality and quantity and diversity that a 30 year old, the 30 year olds in the study had. So that sort of struck a core with me. And then a couple of weeks ago, or maybe it's three weeks ago, whenever Dari and I started talking about this, you know, it always works out that studies pop up when I need them. <laughs> and this one study came up of 612 people from five different countries, uh, UK, France, Netherlands, Poland, and Italy, and they were between the ages of 65 and 79. And what they did is half of them stayed on their regular diet and the other half switched to the Mediterranean diet. Now, they, they followed them for a year, so this wasn't a short-term study, and they also had a measurement of how frail they were. So some were not frail at all, some were somewhat frail and some were very frail. And then when they came back a year later and looked at them, and by the way, they were measuring their poop, of course, what, what, what study doesn't measure poop? Um, so they were measuring that as well. And what they found was that those who were on the Mediterranean diet had 
improved. If they had had some frailty, they had improved it. Their cognitive function had improved. Inflammatory markers like C-reactive protein, which is connect connected to a number of inflammatory conditions, including heart disease, they had been lowered. So they saw all these improvements from the Mediterranean diet. And what they attribute it to, and this goes back to what Daria was saying, is they were attributing it to the benefits of the diversity of the diet. So even though we're talking about the Mediterranean diet, if we wanna look at that and the Chinese study, because there's a lot of diversity in the traditional Chinese diet as well. And as there is in many cultures around the world, probably the only cultures that don't have a really diverse diet are like North Americans, perhaps the British, uh, you know, Australians, perhaps, you know, the more English based kind of Western modern, uh, you know, they kind of jumped on the bandwagon of more fast food, processed food than say some other cultures did. So this is good news for everybody. It doesn't matter what culture you're from, but now what we have to do is get more of those different foods into us. So we've got four recipes for you tonight. And uh, Dari is going to start with her dish. And I will let you, let me get out of the screen share here so they can see you. And then I have to do the tricky thing here to, there we go, full screen. All right. Okay. So am I ready? <laughs> We're going to be, first of all, making um, just a simple pasta dish with some fresh tomatoes. Unfortunately, I don't have a garden, and the ones available in the store are a little bit iffy still. So I find that um, if you have to buy tomatoes at the store, your best bet is usually to get the smaller cherry tomatoes, or these are the grape tomatoes. And this is a pint of set grape tomatoes. And um, I think my recipe said to cut them in half, but these are a little bigger and we're having a, a tiny pasta tonight. So I'm, I'm gonna cut them in thirds or fourths with my super sharp knife while I'm chatting with you. But one of the things that I like to emphasize to my clients is the importance of having a lot of different colors because that's how you know if you're getting like some of each of the different sort of phytonutrients that you need. So probably most people know but tomatoes have lycopene in them which is um, fabulous for your heart and uh, preventing cancer and all kinds of things like that. So don't be afraid of tomatoes. Very few people are probably afraid of tomatoes. They're fabulous. What's that? Right? I didn't, I didn't hear you. what you said. I said, please don't be afraid of tomatoes. They're fabulous. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, a lot of people are scared off because they're like nightshades, right? But yeah. unless you actually have done an elimination diet and you know for a certainty that they bother you, they probably don't. <laughs> Anyway, um, I have a tomato story I like to tell. I think, I think I told Laureen already, but when I was a kid, I actually was a kind of picky eater and I didn't think that I liked raw tomato. I mean, I loved, you know, pizza and spaghetti sauce and things like that, but I did not like raw tomatoes. Aren't those pretty? And my grandfather, my Italian grandfather lived next door and he started a garden one year and um, he brought over like one of the first um, ripe tomatoes, vine ripened tomatoes that he grew and he sat me down on the stoop and he cut into it and he said, here, taste this. And I swooned. It was so, so good. Like I couldn't believe it. Like, oh, that's what a tomato is. That's what it's supposed to taste like. So um, I've been a fan of tomatoes ever since. I don't necessarily cut things the way I do. I'm fearless. But um, so now what I'm doing is slicing my red. Can you see? I'm slicing my 
red onion. And for that quantity of tomatoes, I'm only gonna put like a quarter of a cup in there. So I'm going to chop them fairly small because I'm using angel hair pasta tonight. And I wanna teach you a trick about taming raw onions so they're not quite as obnoxious on your palate. Hold on. So I have a strainer here. And I'm gonna take it over to the sink and just give it a quick rinse with cold water. Take my word for it, I'm not gonna switch the camera around. So it only takes a second. And those go in with the tomatoes. That's a great tip. Yeah. I did not know that. You can, you know, you can soak them in vinegar and all kinds of things that people suggest, but that's the quick and easy way. What else? We need some garlic. So I'm going to select a nice clove from this head here. Oh, it looks like I get bonus, like three of them or something. <laughs> I happen to love garlic. So rich in allicin, which is, um, I think, I believe antibacterial, antiviral, all kinds of good things for your immune system. It's also a different color from the red and the purple that we've already got in the bowl. It's classified as, a, as in the white and tan group, which may not sound exciting, but again, has slightly different phytonutrients that are really important. So don't be shy about garlic. I'm going to mince it up pretty tiny. And I don't always, just so you know. If I'm sauteing it, just ask my husband. A lot of times there'll be big chunks in there. <laughs> okay. So, there we go. Our garlic in the pan, in the bowl. And then, let's see, I want some basil. I want you to know this came from my garden. Good. But you can certainly buy it fresh pretty easily. And I like, you know, all of this is not, it's not rocket science and I don't follow the recipe precisely. It's to your taste. So if you don't, no, if you like fresh basil, you can use less. But I like to just like mash it all up into a ball, get my fingers curled back, hold my knuckles against that blade and just let it rip so that it's real tiny shreds. Notice that rich green color, again, different phytonutrients chlorophyll, folate, probably all kinds of vitamins, beta carotene, who knows? You don't need to know, you just need to eat it. And in that goes. Let's see what else. We're gonna put some salt and pepper on there. I'm kind of um, fussy about the salt. This is Celtic sea salt, which has lots of good minerals in it. You can also use Himalayan pink salt. I think those are the two most recommended ones. And then just some freshly ground black pepper. On top of all of that, I said about four tablespoons of olive oil. I'm gonna eyeball it. Like so. And just a little hint of balsamic vinegar, about a teaspoon. I don't know, it just does something to it. 
I think that was what goes in there. Garlic basil oil. And then find a spoon, mix it all up. Ideally, you want this to marinate while you are cooking your pasta. But since my pasta has already been cooked, I'm just gonna throw it on there and let you see how that looks. Are you getting hungry yet, Lorraine? Um, I ate. <laughs> okay. But it's wonderful. About this one. It's, it smells really good. I bet it does. All right, so it's going over the top. And there you go. Tonight's pasta. And it looks just like that. I'll probably throw some uh, grated Romano cheese. I like Romano better than Parmesan most of the time. It has a, I don't know, it has a really nice sharp flavor for me. And it's also a raw sheep's milk cheese, which I think makes it slightly more digestible. At least that's what I tell myself. And there you have it. Well, that's absolutely beautiful. Thank you. Um, and I'm glad you made the point about tomatoes because I think we can't stand up for the tomatoes enough. It's getting a, the tomato is taking a beating for no good reason. <laughs> you want people to, I can't tell you how many articles I see on the internet and they're talking about one food you should avoid and it's the tomato and it's all like, really, you're going to think the whole world, like that's the, the, the problem going on in the whole world is the tomato. I don't think so. All right. So I just want to ask a question of the audience, as you saw Daria, you know, pour in her olive oil and uh, her vinegar. How many of you, A, make your own salad dressings and B, how many of you measure and how many of you just do what she just did? So you can type that in the chat while I start with the next recipe, which is a tuna bean salad. This is Daria's recipe. It's super easy. One of the things I noticed um, is there's a fair number of ingredients in it, which I thought at first, you know, we're getting brainwashed a bit by having these ideas that, you know, five ingredients or less recipes, you know, keep it simple, make it easy for people, blah, blah, blah. And what I realized when I saw Daria's recipe, we're losing out on diversity because we're going too simple with the recipes. So we want to encourage people, you know, what's the harm with adding a few more things in? Like, it's not a big deal. It's whether you're doing a lot of prep with that in terms of, you know, how you have to chop and cook and multiple steps, but just to throw in extra ingredients which represent flavor is something we should be encouraging people. So let's see what we got here. We got make my own, don't measure, make my own, don't measure, make my own, don't measure. <laughs> Luana says I do just what she did. My kind of people. <laughs> they all are saying don't measure. Excellent. I never measured my dressing. And it's kind of difficult when I'm doing recipes because you have to put the measurements in the recipe. And um, it's easier to not measure and just taste it to your own preference. Yeah. Exactly. Everything. Taste as I go. Perfect. Excellent. All right. So this is nothing to this. Uh, this is a white bean. You could, I've got uh, cannellini beans here. You can have navy beans, whatever you like. So I've got a nice white bean here, and this came out of a can. So you can do that if you want to make it even more simple. You don't want to cook the beans. Um, I've got a can of tuna. This is not the full can because I saved some for the kitties. So I put in the tuna. Her recipe calls for red onions. And... I'm going with white because I didn't have a red onion. Um, there's um, capers. I've never used a lot of capers except in um, an olive tapenade. And I quite like it in the tapenade, so I don't know why I've never used them before. So there's about just a half a tablespoon of capers. There's a clove of garlic, so that's going in there. I've got some red peppers. So in, 
and these were roasted first. So all I did to roast them was just toss them into a baking dish with some olive oil and put them in the oven for about 30 minutes at around 375 degrees. And I didn't take the skins off or anything like that. Now, the recipe says either basil or parsley. Um, I went with parsley because I knew Daria was going with basil. And I go, it says Italian parsley, but I'm growing curly parsley, which I tend to prefer. So if you're not familiar with curly parsley, it looks like it looks like that. But she also has in it fresh sage, which I also have growing in the back. And so I decided, oh, that's different. I've never mixed these two herbs together, nor have I put sage in a salad before. So I thought that would be very good. So I chopped those all up and I put them in. And then the dressing goes on. I'm oh, sorry, there's a little bit of chili pepper, uh, crushed chili pepper flake that goes in. Not too much or you'll live to regret it. Um, and then what I've got here is uh, two tablespoons of apple cider, no, not apple cider, red wine vinegar and two tablespoons olive oil. Now the recipe says three tablespoons red wine vinegar, but I'm doing it at two, just in case I want to play with the proportions. I often find myself adding more vinegar anyway, because that really is what makes it have that nice acid taste that I like so much. And uh, you just pour this on. You want to do some sea salt and pepper, again to taste. and a little bit of salt, and I'm using Himalayan salt. So she uses Celtic sea salt, I use Himalayan salt. Both are high in nutrients. I mean, minerals, trace minerals. And then you just give it a stir. And it's got the pretty colors of the herbs, whether they're green and the red and the yellow, the peppers, and it's ready to serve. But what I would do with this and this is a great salad for doing this with, is put this in the fridge, uh, um, like do it the night before. If you're somebody who has a little bit of a gassy problem with legumes, if you let this sit in the vinegar mixture overnight, a lot of times that will solve the gas problems. There's other things you can do as well. You can ferment the legumes. Uh, that's a different topic altogether. But if you're looking for something quick and easy, you can do this the day ahead and you can serve it the next day. And it's just one way of, you know, getting more, foods into you and saving some time and making it simpler for you. And this will stay for, how, have, you, have, you, have you kept it uh, for more than one day, Daria? Oh, definitely. So how long would you say it would stay in the fridge? Well, um, probably up to three days, I would think. Yeah, that sounds about right. So there you go. This could be a great lunch, by the way. It is a great lunch. <laughs> yes. So it could be a side dish on a main meal or it could be a lunch. It's a very convenient salad and you're getting all kinds of food groups in this one little salad. Okay, and I wanna tell you one more thing about garlic that I learned this a long time ago and then I went looking for the research to find it because I've read it in the newspaper years ago. But basically they said, so this has raw garlic in it. It's not being cooked. And they said, if you leave raw garlic, even if you're going to cook it later, if you let it sit out for about 20 minutes or longer, it doesn't matter, but at least 20 minutes, you up the antioxidants and phytonutrients in the garlic because it's reacting to the oxygen in the air and believe it or not. And there are studies that show this. So I thought that's really cool. But what I noticed, uh, because I had stopped doing it for a while and then I started doing it again and I noticed the smell of the garlic changed when I would come back and smell it 20 minutes. Like if you smelled raw garlic, it has a very strong pungent smell to it, right? Um, it has a better smell to it when it's left sitting. And I remembered that that smell, I remember it from my grandmother's cooking. I hadn't smelled that garlic smell since I was a child. And I remember that that's what I would smell when I was in her kitchen and she was cooking. So I tried to find out from relatives if this is something that is typically done. I couldn't find out because unfortunately too many of the ones who would know have uh, passed on. But 
I'm thinking, you know what? I think maybe people, this is something traditional that may be done in some, some places. So, all right. Um, Luana saying, is this after the garlic is minced? Yes. So you chop it or mince it, or I put it through the press and then you just let it sit. I do this, even if I'm planning to cook it, I do this now. It just, it's a little extra step. And it doesn't matter if it sits out for four hours or it sits out for 20 minutes. So that's, you don't have to be like, oh my God, it's 20 minutes before I'm gonna use it, I better do it. You don't have to do that, you can do it ahead. And it's not a problem. And you let it sit out at room temperature, you can then cover it and put it in the fridge if you're leaving it out you know, overnight or something like that. All right. Um, so Morella is asking, do I have a preferred brand of capers? Do you, Daria? Um, we get a huge jar at Costco. <laughs> I don't even know if you guys have Costco. We have Costco. Yeah, let me, let me get it. Um, I bought the one from Longo's. There's an organic one. I forget the name of it, but I'm, it's from the States and it's all in most of the health food stores in uh, Canada as well. And they also do like a roasted pepper and they do olives. I just can't remember the name of the brand. Um, well, Go ahead. This is Star brand imported. It says it's um, made in, or grown in Turkey, I guess. Well, I wonder, wonder where a caper came from. That would not have well, been. Well, <laughs> I actually have a caper story. Okay. <laughs> we, we got to visit um, Italy a couple of years ago, and we were being shown around by some of my relatives, and we went into this old you know, they have really old little towns up in the mountains and stuff. And there was this bush growing out of the sides of the stone walls. And I'm like, what is that? And they said capers. Like, really? I never knew where they came from. And I always had loved capers, but uh, I had no idea that they they grew like that. Um, well, exactly. We don't see these things. We see them in a jar. Yeah. What do we know? What do um, we know? Carol says she buys the Saver brand. It's an organic brand. Um, Melanie is uh, saying that balsamic is too vinegary for her throat and sometimes makes her cough. So first of all, with balsamic vinegar, it's extremely important you get an aged balsamic. So it is a little right. more expensive, but it's well worth it. It has a sweeter, milder taste. And some of those balsamics that you get uh, that are cheaper, are, they're not even real balsamic, first of all. So you want the real balsamic because it is a fermented process, but they also don't have that richer taste. That being said, anytime you add more too much vinegar or it's more vinegar than you like, just add a little sweetener to it, like some raw honey or some maple syrup. It will take the edge off that sharp taste and it'll be easier for you to um, have that go down your throat and it won't bother you. Remember that acids can break up mu mucus too. So uh, that may also be part of the reason why you're coughing a bit. So if you put in the sweet, you're taking down the acid note a bit and that really helps. You can also use uh, red wine vinegar in its place or you can leave it out altogether, but it's really just a very small amount in that. And I, I love balsamic, but I always make sure I get a nice aged one. Joanne is right. saying that white balsamic is milder. So you could look for that too, Melanie. All right. So Daria, would you like to have them do the next, or would you like, I wish we could have them do the next recipe. Wouldn't that be cool? Um, Before we talk about dessert, um, I was going to also point out that if a person is gluten-free, there's some really good brands of pasta now that are gluten-free, that are made in Italy by people who have been doing it for a long, long time and they know what they're doing. <laughs> and the quality is excellent and you can serve it to almost anyone and they won't realize that it's not, you know, traditional pasta. So that's the FYI. And what was the brand that we found was available? Uh, well, first of all, Barilla makes one with the same ingredients as the one that, um, uh, Daria has and um, it's made with corn and rice and a bit of mono and diglycerides because they have to put something in it to bind it together um, and I'm assuming I, I don't have the package that Daria has so I'm assuming 
and I tried to find the ingredient list for it, but I couldn't. But I did find it available on Amazon in Canada. Of course, it's available throughout the US as well. It's not available at my local grocery store, but it might be at yours, you never know. But what's the name of that brand that you use, uh, Daria? This brand is called Jovial, and it, all it has in it is organic brown rice flour and water. Oh, wow. Yeah. I'd like to know how they pulled that off. Hmm, interesting. Yeah. What? But, but I have different other brands too. You just have to read labels and try things. Yeah, I, I was telling Daria that uh, the way gluten-free pastas were before, um, they were so quick to cook, like they, well, sorry, they took a while to cook, but the, the time between them being undercooked and overcooked cooked was like a nanosecond. And if they were undercooked, they were unpleasant. And then when they were overcooked, uh, they fell apart. And you just, you couldn't even, like even just pouring them into a strainer to drain out the water, they would fall apart. So it makes sense now they're doing things that to make it stronger and, uh, you know, applying more of the natural pasta techniques to it. And this is what you find, or this is what Daria is telling me with regard to the Italian pastas. So they're, they're, they're here, they're here in North America. So, you know, just look on the shelves and see what you can find. Okay, so do you want me to do the cookie instead and then you do the uh, fruit after? Or do you wanna do the fruit and then I do the cookie? Oh, I can do the fruit. Okay, Let's I'm see. ready. So okay. this, is a, this is just a very traditional sort of dessert treatment for Italians. Usually all they have is fruit for dessert and maybe fruit and cookies. But anyway, if you want to get fancy, this is really simple. Uh, I'm just going to take three fourths of a cup of a full bodied red wine. Doesn't have to be expensive. This one happens to be organic. And I'm going to just bring it to a simmer. I don't want it to be like boiling. And when and that gets warm. I'm just gonna stir in some honey and some vanilla and some cinnamon. And I believe you pointed out in your show last week um, the benefits of true cinnamon or Ceylon cinnamon, which I find is available on Amazon. I, it comes in a package like this. Actually, but that has really important health properties and not the least of which is to uh, help balance your blood sugar. So that's an important thing when you're having dessert, right? Yes, it is. But actually I was talking about cassia cinnamon last week. Ah, so again, it's kind of like the red wine, white wine thing. So the original studies were on cinnamon were with the salon. And so they came out with the people who sold it said, oh, it has to be salon if it's not cassia. And then, you know, fast forward a few years, then the cassia studies come out and they have all kinds of benefits too. So we okay. were talking about the cassia cinnamon with regard to the phytonutrients that are found in, for, that are good for the skin. I think it was the Kumarin specifically. So they, they have all, both cinnamons have benefits. It's kind of what you prefer. So they do have a slightly different taste, uh, slightly different look to them. Uh, but the good news is Cinnamon is good. Period. End of sentence. <laughs> and I did experiment with, <laughs> I experimented with a little cardamom in this recipe, but I didn't like it. I, and I could experiment maybe with some nutmeg or something, but cinnamon's, you know, it's pretty reliable. So I'm sticking with that. Yeah, that's what I said last week about it being the top one average, number one aphrodisiac smell. Smell of cinnamon. <laughs> well, I, did, I didn't know we were doing it for that reason, but okay. <laughs> you never know why you're doing things. <laughs> you never know. All right, so is my little hot plate going to work here or? Hmm. I don't know. Oh. Hold on a minute, folks. I think it's not for some reason working. You have any heat? There we go. No, I'm gonna put it on the stove, I'm sorry. But I'll be right back. It makes a whirring sound when it's on. Yeah, I know it does. 
I actually have that same induction element. I actually have two. That's one of the ones I have. That's the one that saw me through my renovations. I caught, I had it up in the spare room where I lived for two and a half months and that's what I cooked on. So there it is, nice and steamy. And I'm going to add, let's see. I'm going to add a tea, two tablespoons of raw honey. I'm not going to measure, folks. There's one, <laughs> there's two. This is raw, unfiltered local honey, by the way. Um, about a teaspoon of vanilla. This is organic. And a half a teaspoon of that cinnamon, which we buy in bulk, and so there it is in a little jar. all that together. And just pour it in the bowl. Easy peasy. So notice we're sneaking in some purple here, some resveratrol and other Anthocyanins. And got some water boiling behind me. It'll be boiling in a minute. And I'm just going to quickly blanch the nectarines so that they're easy to peel. And then I will show you what we do from there. It's boiling. Here we go. It only takes about 30 seconds for that. And I'm going to stick them in ice water as soon as they're done. easy that is. Whoop! Except for throwing it all over the kitchen. Skin slips right off. And I'm going to slice it right into the wine sauce. Just like that. And again, I was thinking in terms of colors, so I chose a yellow, yellow orange sort of fruit because we didn't have any of that color in the other dishes. Unless we put yellow bell pepper into the tuna salad, I suppose. I did do that. <laughs> oh, did you? Okay. Well, you can't have too much yellow. No, you can't. Good for your eyes. It's good for all kinds of things. Just all of these plant foods are just 
like Lorraine has said, are so important for gut health. And that in turn means you're you know, lowering your risk of any sort of disease, diabetes, heart disease, cancer, dementia, all of those things. Uh, Marella is asking where the recipes are posted. Uh, there is a link in the uh, description, at least there better be. Um, if not, there will be. And uh, if you go to that link, you'll find all the recipes posted there. Uh, the replay will be posted there once it uh, has been uh, finished here. And so you've got everything all in one spot. I even put in a reference document for the studies that I mentioned earlier. Awesome. We're getting there. I mean, you know, for a dessert, this is actually really quick and easy. It certainly is. If you were eating those, for putting those fruits in a dessert, you still have to peel them and slice them. So, well, you might not have to peel them, but you definitely have to slice them. So, what's the same? Same thing, right? It is, except that you don't have to wait for it to bake or anything. It's already like ready to go. That's right. All right. And then <laughs> um, I got some blackberries at the farmer's market. We always stock up every year on all kinds of berries and stick them in our freezer. So these were already frozen, but you can use fresh or frozen. There's about a cup of berries. And I'm just going to stir that around. Can you see me? Mm -hmm. Get this out of the way. And of course, it's gonna probably be a little bit better if it also marinates for a little bit before you serve it, which hopefully you're making it before dinner and so that can happen, no problem. But it's quite beautiful to look at, so. There's that too, so there, I mean, that's the other, one of the other things about the Mediterranean diet. It's not just about the food, it's about the relaxed atmosphere when they eat. Um, it's about enjoying the company. It's about eating slowly and really savoring the flavors because the food is so flavorful. They take a long time to get through a meal. And just for fun, I'm gonna garnish it with a little mint, also from the garden. There you have it. Quick. Beautiful. Yeah. So does anybody have any questions about any of that? Do you marinate the fruits at room temperature or in the fridge? I don't think it matters. Um, if you were going to eat it, you know, for dinner, you could just certainly leave it out and let it be room temp, but it's good chilled too. So yeah, and normally I would also like serve it with some yogurt on top just for the probiotics and it, cause it's pretty and it makes you think of whipped cream, but it's <laughs> better for you. <laughs> I will tell you what I would serve it with. I will serve it with whipped cream. <laughs> well, there you go. I've been telling people fruit and yogurt is breakfast. It's not dessert, but I know a lot of people love yogurt with their desserts. So, and if it's a nice, rich, creamy yogurt, um, it does have all the benefits that Daria just mentioned. Um, so the reason I'm doing a cookie is because, again, to me, fruit is not a dessert. So growing up, when you know, we were having, we didn't eat a lot of sugar. We didn't have a lot of desserts or anything, but when we had company or we went to family's house or something like that, I'm also half Italian. So um, the Mediterranean diet tends to come quite naturally to me. Uh, the, there was always cookies. It, when there might be some fruit there. There were always nuts there after dinner and there were always cookies. And uh, uh, especially Italian cookies are tend to be fairly plain and simple. And, you know, I like a texture with my dessert. I like a little crunch. 
So um, I thought, okay, well, I'm just going to do a cookie. And I wanted to do something that was pretty really straightforward. And this is really fast. I'm hoping you can see the food processor, although it's not that necessary that you see it. Um, okay, so basically, there's not much to this. Um, I have two recipes, actually. One is a hazelnut, and the other is a black sesame. So I'm going to show you the black sesame. And all you have to do is put the ingredients into a food processor. And so that's half a cup of butter. I'm going to put in one egg yolk. A cup of flour, and as you can see, I'm using white flour, but it's an all-purpose organic unbleached. And would I experiment with other flours? Yes, I would. But because, see, it's really tricky when you're recommending or doing things to try and meet people's palate ex expectations. And as somebody who has worked with whole grain desserts for many, many years and never gotten the, <laughs> the accolades I used to get when I worked with white flour and, and such, uh, from my family, I kind of have split the difference. So normally I do 50-50, but I just thought because some of the flowers that I might use aren't as easily available, sometimes I like to use spelt, I like to use einkorn. I'm just using a nice organic on purpose for, for this. And then you feel free to experiment as you see fit. I'm putting in a quarter teaspoon of baking powder. And I've got a mixture of two sugars. I've got an evaporated cane juice and a yellow sugar. So the yellow sugar has more nutrients in it than the evaporated cane juice, but the, uh, the evaporated cane juice is still unrefined uh, in, in terms of there's no chemicals or bleach or anything like that. And it's still a little glycemic. So um, if you like sugar, there are ways to use it in the certain recipes that suit your palate and it's, it's about you know, replacing all the white sugars more. We're going to talk about more about this on the 11th. I'll tell you about that in a second. So you just put that in. You put in uh, some vanilla. And then all you have to do is process it. And my processor, oh, sorry, I forgot one very important ingredient. A tablespoon and a half of water. Don't use milk. This will help it bind together better and keep it crunchy and uh, have a nice, nice crispness to it. Now, depending on how well your processor works, sometimes this will go together nicely in the food processor. Mine likes to collect stuff on the bottom. So I just turn it out and finish mixing it all together with my hands. It's a soft dough. And then what we're gonna do is roll them into balls. So what I do for the sesame, and by the way, for the hazelnut, I also add it after I've made the dough. But for the sesame, what I like to do is take half of it. And then I have lightly roasted the black sesame seeds and ground them in a coffee grinder. I add this to one part because I like to get a two-tone thing going. And I tried making where I just didn't mix it very well with sesame to see if that did enough two-tony stuff. But it's actually easier if I mix half of it with the sesame and then make the balls with some of each parts of the dough. So I just mix this and then I just take a little bit of the dough and I'm making about, it's about half the size of a walnut. And I plop that on. This makes about 24 cookies. 
see it's got a nice two-toneness to it. Okay, you can see some of the dark black. I just found it when it was all one color, it wasn't as appealing because it turns gray because of the black sesame seeds. Oops. And then what you want to do is take, whoops, take a fork and press it down to flatten it. So I just hold it, take the, the cookie and you can see that they're nice and flat now. And then I just sprinkle. So the, the black sesame that went in the cookie is toasted. The black sesame that goes on top is not, it's just the straight black sesame seeds. So I sprinkle a few on top and they go into the oven. And presto magic, they come out of the oven and they multiply magically. There they are. So <laughs> these are really nice little cookies. They're simple. And as I said in the recipe, sometimes a cookie just needs to be a cookie and you don't need to overthink things and be worrying about this ingredient or that ingredient. Sometimes you have to do what you want to do for joy. And if you want to have your cookie to taste a certain way that pleases you, that is as good for your health as anything else. And as long as the ingredients are real uh, and, not, and you know, based on the actual principles of good baking, uh, you can't go wrong. Okay, so that's our four recipes. Oh, Luana was saying cookies with espresso. Uh, you can do that too. Um, so that is our four recipes. Do you guys have any questions? Doesn't seem like you've had some really good comments and suggestions and such. Um, do you have anything else you'd like to say, Daria? So if you want to go and uh, learn more about what Daria does, you can go to the page with the recipes. There's a lovely uh, link to her website. She has a free um, download for you if you want. What's the title of your download? It's Feed Me Healthy Right Now. My top tips for eating healthy when you're in a hurry. So it's mostly about, you know, how to be ready, how to have a pantry that's well stocked and and then just a few suggestions of other recipes that you can just pull from what you have. Excellent. Yeah. And again, you know, as you can see, Daria uses a lot of different ingredients. So even though it's in a hurry, you're probably still getting a lot of nutrient variety and different types of foods and, and the things that she's suggesting. Well, thank you very much, Daria. This has been fabulous. And um, boy, that looks good, the fruit. Um, <laughs> that was good too. <laughs> um, next week, I will be doing a segment alone because I decided since, you know, Daria got me thinking about pasta that I would do a segment on how to make sourdough pasta. So this is something I've been experimenting with. And so, um, I think I can show you some really cool things and we can talk about pasta in general and things like Durham semolina wheat. We can talk more about the gluten-free pasta and uh, you know tips and things like that. So I'll be doing that next week. And then on the 11th, I'll be here with Morella Kojaka and she actually texted me a description, <laughs> which, <laughs> which I saw after we did this. So we're going to have a sweet talk about sugar replacements and demo a couple of full, uh, a couple of recipes full of chocolate and goodness with unexpected ingredients. So we will clue you in on the unexpected ingredients uh, on the 11th. So that's what we have for you. Uh, thank you everyone for attending. Uh, you've been a great audience as always. And um, yeah, thank you. Thank we'll you. See, thank you, Daria. And uh, we'll see you next time, uh, next week. Okay. Bye now. Okay. We are out.